Right, so let's get going. Welcome um, and good afternoon to the um, Public Transport Information Coordination Group, um, December pre-Christmas 2021, though. Um, I do feel lonely still as the only visible Christmas cheer on the call, but uh, that's not unusual. Um, so um, let's do some uh, introductions. So I'm Tim Rivet. I am the chair of PTIG and run RTIG. Um, and so um, minutes of the uh, last meeting, um, which hopefully you uh, have on email um, a bit ago. Um, so, um, shout out if there's anything uh, wrong with them, please, um, as we go through. Um, so, there's an action for me and John to talk about um, fares and basic. We had that conversation after the last um, call and various um, events have happened. Um, encouraging people. Um, then um, on fares, um, which we will pick up um, under the agenda on um, fares for BODs, but um, that we'll talk about that document. Um, then um, there was an offer from Transport API for access to their fares tool, which is live. Um, if you want to uh, access fares data in a um, non-raw format, then uh, I would encourage you to talk to Jonathan. Um, then there was an action under the NAPTAN stuff for Adrian to talk to Mark Taylor um, about stop areas and hierarchies. I don't remember that one. I was speaking to Mark about something else. Um, in fact, I messaged him on his last day, but it was too late to know that it was his last day. Um, he responded to me quite late in the evening on his last day, so I unfortunately missed him. I tried to respond, but I think his email had been closed before I got back to it. But I will, I will, I will check through the records on that one. I'm not quite sure what that's referring to, to be honest. Yeah, I'll presumably um, uh, where I'll um, pick up with you if there's uh, anything outstanding anyway. Um, and then... Yeah, if you could... Sorry, yep. Yeah. I was going to say, if, yeah, if you could send anything through to me and also to Mark Lawrence, who's, um, who's our manager, and one of some will pick it up. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Um, then under electronic display interface, there was a question about prediction engines and whether the DFT had um, plans. Um, that discussion is, is still going on with the department. Um, Artig hosted a working group earlier this week to um, try and understand what um, authorities and potential users of a prediction engine might want um, and what they might use it for. Um, so uh, that is uh, ongoing. And then NetEx accessibility profile, um, we'll pick up progress on, on that under um, EU standards development um, and um, issues log um, the um, standing um, invitation for people to raise issues and things like that. that. That was the minutes of the last meeting. Is there anything, any matters arising or anything people want to say? No. Okay. Can I just ask, um, Tim, you know, all the meetings that have been gone on recently for NAPTAN and such like, 
Have they all yeah. been recorded or, or, or not? Um, or just... Most of them have been um, and are available. Um, there's a page on the Artig website that lists them all or um, and it's got links to all the mural boards um, or you can find the recordings uh, directly on YouTube. Um, there's been a couple where um, either we've not been in directly involved um, because they've been about very specific things where they're not re been recorded, but all of the um, public ones um, with open invitations and things like that, they're all being recorded and made available. Right, okay, so the one that recently with the summary of Nap Tank, I think it was earlier this week or with recently that I didn't manage to, yeah, that's been, that's good. Okay, I'll, I'll seek that out, thank you. Yeah, no, it's a good one just, to what Adrian just quick, We had one on the API this week, which um, we did record it, but we're not as uh, technologically advanced as Tim is, and so it's a massive file on a hard drive in DFT's estate, and I'm not sure how I would get that out there. Um, I would be happy to come and do a personal one-to-one -one on the API, um, it, which would probably be easier for all involved um, and could probably be done a bit quicker as well, um, if anybody wanted that to save me trying to export a 300 megabyte file. Yeah. Okay, cheers. Yeah, thank you, Adrian. Um, okay, so um, Bus Open Data Service. Um, got an update from them. I don't know whether that's you, Mirror, or tr you, Triumph. I don't know who's going to give us an update. Oh, thanks. I think the plan was for Triumph to provide a, a, a an update on the um, release of 1.15 NOR, which is the launch of the Siri VM validator for the service. Um, so, Triumph, for you able to share the slides? Sure thing, Mirror. Um, Thank you. I haven't, haven't shared on, on GoToMeeting before, so I'm not quite sure how. Ah, there we go. Um, just give us a minute. Please confirm if you can see my screen at some point. Yep. You can see the screen. Perfect. Okay. So um yeah we, um triumph we've we've got the your presenter view rather than the slides okay this is better uh yeah okay so um yeah it's just a um a quick summary on our board service release 1.15.0 um So um, the new releases, new release has focused on providing sort of CRVM validator uh, to AVL feeds uh, to, to standardize sort of location data and improve its quality. Um, so bot publishers will be provided with uh, reports on CRVM schema validation checks um, where um, publishers would have their feeds validated um you know as parts of different statuses so as a non-compliant um there's a partial compliant and there's a um both compliant status um the purpose of this is to inform sort of operators of any missing mandatory field fields and um allow data consumers to address any data discrepancies that uh provided data feeds may have um also um Publishers should now be provided with, uh, you know, um, a dashboard, um, sort of, um, you know, showing uh, the view of of their compliance. Um, this is to sort of enable them sort of visually see and report any actions, um, uh, and and send these to their CRVM suppliers, whoever the suppliers may be. Um, also. Um, from a, a, a PTI validator perspective, um, you know, new checks have been added to ensure that, you know, both journeys serve one or more loca uh, localities uh, in common. Um, updates to revision logic to enable zip files with multiple revision numbers um, 
have been loaded uh, to be loaded successfully for different times have been made. Um, also, um, updates to validation of boards uh, PTI to check if non nafton stops um, are used for more than two months have also been added um, as part of this uh, service release. Um, what this means, um, this is part of um, our effort to progress with the ensuring with ensuring that location data is compliant uh, with uh, our profile validation. Um, this is to support the provision of high quality um, real time location data to data consumers and app developers. Um, we feel that this supports um, or, or this lays the foundation for providing sort of um, high quality location data because we believe high quality location data is a foundation uh, layer for uh, prediction services, informing passengers, you know, how many, you know, how far and how many minutes their bus is away from bus stop, how long their, 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 their journey will take, uh, which ultimately sort of enhances uh, passenger experience, um, you know, help them sort of with better journey planning, uh, reduced waiting times, um, and all of that. Um, so this, this in, in, in summary is, is, uh, is a summarization of um, the, the release, uh, uh, the service release uh, for, for BODS 1.15.0. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, sorry, I, I, I have one. Sure. Um, the uh, legal requirement is on the bus operator. Um, whereas the supplier of much of this data are organizations like Ticketer, who don't have a, a legal requirement to comply um, and possibly are not even getting paid for compliance. So how, how are you getting the pull through from the legal requirement on the operator to the people who actually supply the data, who many operate, particularly the smaller ones, are utterly reliant upon? Uh, thank you very much uh, for the question, Nick. Um, in terms of exactly how we're getting the pull through, um, you know, I believe, and you know, I admit, I, I am not very active on, on on the business change side of things, and you know, I'm not um, having this direct one-to-one uh, -one, uh, interaction with uh, with suppliers and and their agents. Uh, can I take that one away and and provide you with an answer? Uh, at a later thank bit? you. Yeah, thank that'd you. be very useful and I'm happy to help and support it in any way I can you know mm -hmm. but um, I, I, I think it could be a sort of a, a block in the road because I have seen I've seen Omni and Ticketer you know uh, have they're, they're just not getting paid sometimes mm -hmm. for, for the the expectation upon them and it, it makes it difficult because the operators are not necessarily that literate when it comes to this stuff and have a, a tremendous dependency on these mm -hmm. kind of things, they've outsourced this kind of thing. So it'd be a useful thing to explore. I'd be very ha happy to do that with you. Thank you very much, uh, Nicholas. Um, I, I would get back to you um, as soon as possible. Thank you. Mm -hmm. so, Triumph, I've noticed that um, whenever there's an update to BODS recently, um, we're now getting um, uh, service release notes yeah. with an up with with the details of what's changed and things like that i think mm -hmm. that's a really good uh development and, and very very helpful thank you very much Tim. uh and it's it's something we 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 hope to to, to continue mm. excellent um anybody got any more questions about the release process and notes no okay um, so um Mira's had to uh, pop off for a minute or two um, but she'll be back in in a bit um on location data um we've had um profile documentation and advice for um routes and timetables for a little while um and people are familiar with that um a couple of weeks ago we released 
um, a draft of the profile documents for Siri VM. Um, there shouldn't be any surprises in that, seeing as it's the same um, technical content that was being discussed over the summer with people. It's just um, put into uh, more of a, a formal document format. Um, and so we welcome comments and feedback on that um, by Christmas, please. Um, and we've got a Q&A call on it um, on Monday lunchtime. Um, if you want to, uh, to, to have an interactive Q&A on it. Um, and uh, if you didn't get the um, email with the links to the, uh, to the document and things, uh, let me know and I'll um, forward them on to you. That anything anybody wants to say about location data more generally? Sorry, I've got a question, Tim. Um, Leicester City Council, which is a project that I'm not directly involved in there, they're introducing a new journey planner in conjunction with the county council. Um, but I think they're, go they're going to be taking, uh, the, the, the journey plan is being provided by Skent Go, which I think is an Australian company. Um, and they're going to be taking a, a Siri SM feed from our VIC system and a Siri VM feed from BODS, I think, to save costs because it's free from BODS. I just wondered if you think that's a good idea or not. Or um, it depends, I think, on, on what you're trying to achieve. Um, S Siri SM is certainly the right thing for, for things from a stop perspective. And if you're wanting to show um, a bus moving around on a map, then Siri VM is um, the thing to be consuming. So if that's what you're hoping to achieve, um then yeah they sound sounds reasonable and and the right sort of thing to be doing and it it will be very interesting i think to um get a little bit of a write up when that's done on um what you've done particularly with the bods feed and how you're presenting that because um that would help to to get some use cases out there and encourage more people to use the data Right. OK. Yeah, because I just that is just, just the thing that it's coming from two separate sources. So there's a there's the, the chance of some kind of mismatches, I suppose. And um, I guess until until the odds feed becomes fully mature, I guess there's there's going to be some gaps until. It's all. All the all the tweaks have, have, have been done, shall we say? Yeah, I, I suspect that it, that there'll be consistency between the feeds because you'll have the same operators. Um, if you've got small operators that aren't feeding into your local real-time system, then they'll be probably missing from BODs as well. Um, yeah. Because once you've got a feed available, you're going to supply it to to anybody that that's that's wanting it. So. I suspect that there's probably not as much difference as you might think. Okay, all right, that's good to hear. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? No, okay, have we got, Mary are you back yet? No. OK, um, if we move on to fares then. Um, so um, we were due to um, have um, an update on fares from Stephen Penn. Um, unfortunately, he's um, having a few um, um, problems following his booster. Um, yesterday, not feeling very well at all, poor lad. 
Um, so um, he's um, given me an update. Um, so um, pairs data is be supplied to BODs um, in NetEx format, as I'm sure you're aware by now. Um, the NetEx fares. Tim, just to say, yes. I am. I am here. Um, so I was just taking a few moments to come off mute. Okay. So um, um, you want it's... to pick up on um, routes and timetables? Anything that Triumph didn't talk about? So do you have any specific questions? Um, anything that so, I, I wasn't here. Okay, so Triumph did his update. Yeah, so Triumph talked about the release that's just happened with the validator. Mm. Um, right. Okay. Things. So, so, um, so the so the one point one five release for Bods was launched last week, um, and that also coincides at the same time with the the, the Naptan release as well, which um, Adrian obviously. Um, we'll um, cover the um, in terms of the location data. So the launch of the validator seems to have actually gone really well. Um, so we had about nineteen thousand vehicles pro providing location data feeds to BODs. Um, of uh, there's approximately thirty three thousand vehicles nationwide. Um, TFL published all of their location data um, last month. And so that took the vehicle count up to 26,000 on board, which was, you know, really, yeah, we were really pleased with that. Um, and of those vehicles, um, as I say, since the introduction of the validator, that seems to have been quite positive. It, the, the location data validator was probably the of the two validators, timetables and, and location data, probably the one um, that had less impact on operators. There were 30 operators who were adversely impacted by the um, launch of the location data validator, and that actually includes um, National Express. So we've literally just had a call with National Express a few moments ago to talk to them about um, the issues they're trying to resolve to get their location data feeds back onto BODs. And from a, um, a timetables perspective, so the validator for timetables launched back in May. It was locked in September. National Express were the first of all of the operators to publish fully compliant um, timetables data sets to the new stand, um, to the pre, to the standard um, first. And um, Stagecoach had published about they they were, they were about two thirds of the way there with their data. They've had um, they've been yeah I think service code seems to be causing most issue um, in meeting the validator requirements. And then go ahead and Arriva were just um, currently publishing their data in a compliant format um, to boards. Um, and then from a FERS perspective, so uh, we're, and we're, we've been really pleased to see FERS data starting to be published to the bus open data service. Um, so it, what we've seen so far from a, um, a FERS and ticketing perspective is it, it's really um, Stagecoach have published all of their FERS data um, and they were the first of the operators to do that. Um, I think they have a, a kind of a press release um, prepared for that. And um, the, the other operators, so... Um, so Stagecoach published all of their data. I think first they published, so they published York um, and then four other data sets beyond that. Arriva published 11 data sets at last count. Um, and then go ahead um, and um, so National Express is set to publish by the end of this month. They should have done their hopper first by mid-December. And I, I think a lot of you might know that um, the, um, the National Express the kind of transition to a flat fur structure, so I think it's a £2.40 fur across the whole of, of the West Mids um, so that has really, I think what that's done is really simplified the, um, the, 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 kind of the I suppose the publishing flow forward, I mean we are trying to encourage the other operators to, uh, because it is very much part of the national bus strategy and the um, the requirements in the national bus strategy 
to um, you know, really, I think, make that offer for, for passengers um, you know, much more, I, say, I suppose, um, streamlined, really, and make it much easier for the operators to understand, um, for, the, for the consumers to understand bus fares in areas. So trying to, to have, you know, clear pricing structures for multimodal, for multi-operator, and then flat fares and um, and we think the a transition towards flat fares would also support the introduction of you know, London style ticketing, particularly in the main urban areas where you um, have a, a you know essentially a zonal system and then a flat fare system just for bus a zonal system at multimodal level and then just um, so yeah so so we've been um, pleased with the progress that the operators are making. Um, from a first perspective and yeah i think that's probably everything to say um obviously the analyzed bus data service was launched for local authorities i know we've got some of the local authorities here and um, the team have recently released the corridor functionality for that service so we've been really actually i mean that's been a great addition um putting the corridor functionality into the analyzed bus data service and again we just see that as a as another you know example of how that service can support local authorities and operators to partner effectively to ensure that they're D delivering the the objectives of the national bus strategy um, and they can actually get access to the, the to the to the data that they need to tell them you know, so for example average journey times and average speeds or at the very heart of the national bus strategy and so you know, having access as um, a, a free to access service for all local authorities where they can you know, see for all of their operators publishing data to bots, the average journeys and average speeds for those services is, um, you know, I think quite a significant step forward. Um, probably also just worth saying as well, um, I know some of the local authorities were inquiring about disruptions data. Um, and so um, the, the user research is completed now on, on um, disruptions. Um, as many of you know, we have a disruptions messaging tool, which is available to the five mayor or combined authorities in the north. Um, the, the, that contract is due to expire at the end of March next year. And there's just a, 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 I suppose a question about um, what the new contract includes and whether, for example, it's scaled so that um, local authorities um, be out the EU is the other mayor or combined authorities and whether they have access to it and then also then what about the other local authorities um so you know the smaller the interurbans and should the bus operators have access to it as well and um, certainly in the mayor or combined authorities that are utilizing it at the moment they can grant operator access to the local authority account um and we think that, that based on the research we can see absolute value in um, all of the local authorities having access to it, the um, the bus operators having um, the certainly the bigger bus operators having access to it because they'll have the resources to to in include cancellation data, and then um, looking at introducing functionality for um, the creation of cancellation, so trip level data rather than service level data in there, um, so that's just being finalised as well. Um, and as you know, Tim, uh, we did the work on flexible services as well. And flexible services aren't yet, um, I think, properly accommodated within the BOD service or properly, um, there, there isn't a clear publishing flow for operators at the moment who run flexible services. And so um, that is um, that research is also completed and we have a profile now um for flexible service data to go into pods um, and we're also working with the war on mobility team in, in dft who are uh, essentially we're pilots of flexible services across the country um primarily in rural areas but potentially testing other areas um other use cases as well so for example railway stations and um service organizations um so, so yeah so that that's that that's where we're up to um, does anyone have any questions? I realise that was a bit of a, a, a whistle stop tool. Any questions? No? Okay. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Mira.
Um, so on fares, um, the um, there's some work going on that Stephen Penn is leading that we've he's talked to us about before, um, looking at standardisation um, and the development of um, the profile documentation um, and um, we um he's um got that document the technical um document to the point where um it's about ready to release um having discussed um the process of consultation um for that sort of document with him a couple of weeks ago um rather than releasing it to you um before christmas at the same time that you're having to contend with christmas data and the siri vm um profile document um the plan is to uh, release that um early in january um and hold um q a sessions and things like that um in the same way that we did for trans exchange um and are doing for um Theory stuff, um, and so during January there'll be a lot of activity around um, fares profile standardisation and things like that. So um, when you come back, um, no chance to put your feet up um, after uh, the Christmas break. Um, you'll need to be thinking about fares. Um, one of the things that um, he uh, is um, looking at is the development of a fares validator um, in the same way that there's one for trans exchange um, and um, Siri VM location data um, and there's some uh, user research work going on um, at the moment that ends um, in late January and they're, they're talking at the moment to people like Vicky uh, VIX and Ticketer and um, Transport API about um, how that validator um, might work. Um, and so if you want to get involved in that work, then um, either contact uh, Stephen Direct or come through me and I'll uh, pass you on to him. Um, the current plan um, is to um, introduce um, fares validator um, end of quarter one next year, so March, April time, um, and then um, go through the same process um, as um, took place for um, Trans Exchange. So start off for a period of time um, with soft warnings just to. Uh, get people used to um, making their data um, fit the profile um, and then introduce a hard um, warning um, process uh, for basic fares and then go through the same process of a soft warning um, period and before introducing hard block for complex fares because if you Remember, um, on fares, it's a two-stage process with the deadlines um, being different for um, simple, more basic fares um, and um, longer period of time before um, more complex fares needs to be um, contained in BODs. Um, so um, looking at um, somewhere between um, a year to two years to um, get to the point where we've got um, hard blocks in place for uh, all fare types, uh, depending on uh, on how quickly people uh, can adopt the profile, get their systems in place, and then get the data in place. Are there any questions on fares? No. Okay. 
Um, in which case, um, we'll then move on to um, bus stops um, and the NAPTAN project. So um, I think that's you, Adrian. Yeah, that's fine. But Tim, may I just correct you? And NAPTAN is not just bus stops. Um, no, that's it's... very true. I'm sorry. It, I hang my it's head a home for all modes. <laughs> Um, I haven't uh, I haven't come with a huge presentation actually today. I just wanted to give people an update of how things are going with um, the closing down of the download for the old NAPTAN service and moving into the using the new download. Um, so we switched on the new service on the first of May, um, and uh, first of May. Sorry, my brain went dead then for a second. First of November, um, and so it's been running for about six weeks now. Uh, in the last few weeks, certainly since we did more comms around the API, we've had um, quite a bit of feedback around some errors in the files. Um, so we've been working through those. I had a session today with the team to look at them. And I think what actually has been happening is that there are some issues with the files that the local authorities are providing us, some things that have been hidden by the old NAPTAN um, for some reason, and we weren't aware of this. It was correcting some of the data um, that was being supplied erroneously. Um, so what we are doing now is just working out who we need to contact at local authorities um, to go back and get those um, uh, changes amended. So there's things like there are um, all the stops in Merseyside, I think, for example, have got the administrative area reference. Um, they've used the NAPTAN code rather than the oh, the the ATCO area code, as opposed to the administrative area code, um, which is 280. Um, and I don't think the administrative area codes go up that high, and so it's throwing an error in some systems. So there's four or five little issues like that that we've identified, or people have identified, and thank you to the people that have flagged them to us, and we're working to try and get those fixed with the local authorities um, to make sure that the data is uh, is correct as, as possible. Um, we've, because of some of those issues and because the API was a couple of weeks later than we hoped it would, we, we've asked, uh, we've moved the deadline for closing down the old NAPTAN download service to the 14th of January. Um, and so we're looking, we're going to look now to close it down on the 14th of January. Um, that won't affect MPTG, that won't affect upload or the last submissions page. So all those things will still be accessible. It will just be the download service that we're looking to move. Um, and if anyone does have any issues and they're worried about any of the changes, please do get in touch um, and we will see what we can do for you um, and see if we can help you because we don't want to we, we don't want to inconvenience anyone. Um, is there any questions on that? I take silence as, as a no then. So thank you for you, Adrian, um, and thank you for all the work that you've done um, on that time um, to get it to this point. Um, thank you. So um, that then um, rolls us on to um, I plan, therefore I am. Um, so um, this is all about um, journey planning and um, Poor Mr. Carr's attempt to try and get to a football match um, <laughs> a little while ago um, and some problems that he came across. Yeah, and, and not only mine, Tim, it was uh, also a, a, a UK based experienced transport professional that uh, works largely in Poland these days. Um, who was trying to get from Luton Airport to his two family bases uh, and couldn't really find a way of doing it economically without uh, visiting various sites. Uh, and that led me to think, particularly my own experience, you know, I had um, rather complacently lapsed into thinking, well, there's so many journey planners around now. They must all be equally good or they wouldn't still be in business. I got irritated with those journey planners that are still on a regional basis and uh, required you manually to change regions when you moved around the country. Uh, but apart from that, I assumed everything was pretty hunky-dory about the quality of the routes that came out. And what really drove it home to me was when the uh, 
journey planner, which I hasten to add was not the TFL one um, that I was using in London, uh, changed between, between, between buses in Brixton rather than the obvious shortest journey time, I would assume, although Peter Stoner, who's not here, has said that there could be occasions on which this assumption was wrong, but the quickest journey time to get to Euston from Brixton, I would have sort of said was always going to be the Victoria Line if you're changing buses outside the Victoria Line station. Um, and so it proved because I, I ended up that day beating by half an hour, which meant that I needn't have incurred the hour, the, 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 the wrath of NHS of not sitting for half an hour or quarter of an hour to uh, get over my booster jab. Um, but I, I managed to beat the three or four journey plans that I'd had by half an hour to get from uh, Penge in southeast London to, to Luton. And that <clears throat> really said to me, yes, there's, I think, some justification for journey planners perhaps getting different answers. And I thought back to a time when I was um, actually gamefully employed and at a uh, a European project meeting in Milan, I think it was. And I'd said one of the concerns that we had in the UK at that time was different results from different journey planners. And an Italian gentleman got up and made what I thought was a very, very interesting point and said, well, in terms of we who deal with road journey planners, we actually think it's quite a good thing if we get different results because it spreads the load in congested circumstances. Now, is that anything that applies in public transport? Probably not in post-COVID circumstances, but it probably was uh, if you looked at uh, systems like London's uh, pre-COVID. But anyway, com coming back to <clears throat> the main thrust, what did I do about this? I tried Anthony Smith um, at uh, uh, transport focus and also DFT uh, to see what observations they had and suggested that in fact this was the sort of research that transport focus tends to be good at because it's the behavioral end it's it's actually interpreting what the customer really wants rather than what we as specialists think the customer ought to know which can be two subtly different things and that uh, this was something that we, we needed to have a look at. The dimensionality then changed a bit with the ATCO drop-in, uh, and also to a certain extent, um, uh, Anthony's rather flippant comment that uh, his uh, experience of interpreting the um, results that PF had had, or TF, no, it'd be PF in those days, um, which was that many people just set off and hope that once they hit the public transport system, they'll be able to navigate their way through it. Um, but uh, as I interpret what DFT is trying to do, particularly with things like the, the National Bus Strategy, what they really want to do is to have a journey planner or perhaps a comparative journey planner, which says, here are the advantages of using particular modes, you know, much the same way as when we had the uh, Transport Direct Journey Planner, that would show you what you were saving in CO2 over making a comparable journey in, in, in your private car. Um, so we had this ACTO drop-in, which for those of you that aren't familiar with ACTO was um, a lunchtime chat with a presentation by a supplier, in this case, um, a passenger. And unfortunately, this one was not recorded, um, but a very interesting discussion. And there were some views that, you know, do we really want people to go to the journey planner or do we want them to come straight to an authority or an operator? My view is still that we want them to go to a journey planner because you're really wanting to take the overview in the first instance 
of what you've got available. And that's where I think choice is important as well. You know, you should be able to choose. And um, for example, if you look at Google Maps as a universally available or almost universally available journey planner these days, it allows you to distinguish between best route, i.e. minimum time, or minimum walking or minimum changing. And um, so I think choice is a valuable feature. But the recommendation that I think uh, everybody more or less supports is that we should have a brief discussion here and see if there is a, a consensus this is a problem which is, is one which should be further investigated and b if so what are the key features of it and what sort of resource do we need to do it now my view would still be that it's the sort of thing that passenger uh, that sorry transport focus i must think of those terms these days transport focus is is good at and has done with first of all the rail passenger survey then the um, bus passenger survey and then with the suite of more detailed investigations that they carry out now as a matter of course um, i regret to say i'm taking the lazy option of saying that uh, if it is research that should be done it probably should be funded by dft from the minor research budget um, we could seek a sponsor for it i suspect i i, I suggest but uh, there would be risks of uh, supplier bias in that so there it is that's my nutshell of the problem over to you lot any thoughts and comments from anybody um I, uh, so, so uh, I thought that was quite an, uh, I suppose, an interesting discussion um, that you started there, John. And um, what I'd probably say is, um, so it is something that we've discussed internally uh, within DFT as to whether we would want to. Um, you certainly the, the current approach is to intervene where we feel that the market hasn't been able to to meet the requirement and and. Um, you know, it's, um, we've seen really great progress, as many of you know, with timetable data and the creation of a national timetable data set. We've seen um, a degree of progress with location data and building a location data set, but not necessarily a complete one that was nationwide. And obviously with FERS, that was always the, we didn't really have a national FERS data set. Um, so this was the area where at the time it was felt it was appropriate for government to intervene. Um, we deliberately chose not to intervene in the journey planning space, partly because we, we have a, an open market in the UK um, with many um, journey planners like Google and CityMapper and Mooga who all you know, provide really um, excellent services. And what they were saying to us, you, we can build the journey planner, we just need data. Um, and so that was the problem that we, 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 we set to solve. Um, I think now we're, it's quite interesting because we're also talking to Bayes and DCMS at the same time who are obviously starting there. Um, I, I did see that, Julie, by the way. Um, I have, um, I have had, a, had a look at that and I thought it was quite interesting. We've been talking to Bayes and DCMS about the smart data programme and thinking about the consumer applications of data. And I think the, the other thing is um, you're thinking about, okay, well, from a journey planning perspective, what are the objectives that government want to drive and what are the objectives that, for example, private sector providers of journey planning solutions want to drive and they're not always necessarily the same. Um, and from a government perspective, the things that we would like consumers to focus on are not just planning their journeys around the, the, the amount of time taken to travel, which is quite often the decision point that's given to them when they put a journey plan in and they, they, they're given, for example, in, in Google Maps, the journey plans for the various modes. Um, there's, I suppose there's two challenges there. First of all, um, you, usually the, the, the data is presented in the form of the time taken and public transport won't always compete. Sometimes it does take longer to complete a journey on public transport. That doesn't necessarily mean that completing a journey on public transport isn't the right option. Actually, if you can integrate some of your activity for that day, 
and if it's better for the environment, if it's more cost effective in the longer term. All of these are things are things that need to be taken into account and also accessibility. And these are decision points that and, and satisfaction, the decision points that aren't always provided as data in journey planners. So I think there's a question of seeing how the, the private sector market responds and starts to help consumers and passengers make better decisions about travel that support government objectives um, that go beyond just the amount of time taken to complete the journey. So that's the, the first thing I'd say. And then the second thing I would say is the, the other question that's really on my mind is whether it's giving, whether our role in government is to provide things like journey planning solutions, or if the more, if we think the market is actually able to do that, is the role of government to actually help consumers make better decisions. So for example, giving them things like choice engines and enabling them to make comparisons by geographies or by um, bus operators or by local authority areas and comparing services based on based on the average speed, the average time taken, the, the you know, first analysis, emissions, um, accessibility, satisfaction. You know, and 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 that 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 to me you, you starts to feel like is is that what we need to enable consumers to do? It's just, it's, it's you know, actually the market's already provided journey planning solutions. Is there a role for government now? Is there just a role for government to um, really help people make better decisions or be better informed about the delivery of public transport in that in that area? I'd like to just sort of come in here because I, I I joined DFT when DFT had a journey planner and it cost us six million quid a year. It was pioneering. It was epic in many ways. Uh, but the government digital service said we had to shut it and that it wasn't policy at the time for government to provide a journey planner. So we mm -hmm. shut it. Actually, it still had features. I mean, it, it didn't look very nice, but it did some incredible stuff. It was good, very good in its own way, um, and it was the world's first. We did shut it. Now, we, we could have a change of policy, but I, I, I think Mira has touched on all the reasons why this is probably unlikely to land. And I, I think that the the challenge with journey planners at the moment is the data. Um, that's one of them. And the other is how myopic they are in terms of what they think they're providing to users. DFT is doing incredible work on getting the data right. And, and the journey is in train at the moment, by no means complete. But by the time we've got really, really good data, then I, I think you will see a, uh, a, a significant move towards the most reliable journey planners that are plugged into the, the really the best data. And we shouldn't forget that something like Google Maps is global. Um, even though Google itself, some parts of Google don't even know they've got Google Maps and, and it's a sort of a byproduct. There are other parts and parts such as Snowdrop Solutions, who I've worked with, who work very closely with Google Maps, who Google Maps is in, Google rather, is invested in, that really try to make the journey planner as good as it possibly can be. Uh, the amount of money that Google has got and the fact that it's looking at the entirety of journeys and looking at all the disruption and as many sources as it gets its hands on, I just honestly I don't think government could compete with with, with Google or some of the investment money going into. And I, I don't think it should. It, it would it would be a wasted endeavour because let's face it, the UK government. I mean, in this territory, it's probably only concerned with England. Mm -hmm. Google looks at the whole thing globally. Yeah. And it's yeah. a pretty tough thing oh, to follow. Oh, okay. Um... I accept what you say about investing in developing a journey plan, but let's not forget that for the Olympics, and I think this is what you're referring to, Nick, we had uh, the excellent development of a journey planner that helped people with mobility impairments. Yeah. Uh, that work is being maintained in some places, but in other places seems to be uh, largely lost at the moment. Uh, what I'd suggest is we're not asking for investment in a journey plan. And what, what we may actually be doing is to say, 
here are the requirements of a good journey planner to make the most effective use of the data that BODS is collecting, which is a recasting, perhaps, yeah. of the question. But I accept that all that Mira said, you, you, you know, it, it, it isn't just fastest or the least number of changes. There's I mean, one bit important no. to some people, particularly disabled people, the, mm -hmm. the level of comfort and amenity in the vehicle may be important. Mm. Um, and one, one you, thing you, I would say, oh, sorry, John. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to dash soon. I'm going to rejoin the call. Um, but I think the one thing I would say is we did receive the travel line research, and it is something that I'd read some, I'd, I'd read a, a, a while back about sort of the travel line research, and it is something we've been asking Transport Focus and Travel Line about. And I think we're, we're really interested to think about how we could work with Travel Line, given that it is a trusted journey planner who support the, 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 the Travel Line team to kind of be that trusted partner with government to deliver a um, you know, essentially a service that that does um you know, both utilize bod's data which we know it already does um but also um you know, as that um you know as a not-for-profit it actually acts as a journey planner that builds the trust of consumers and passengers and and goes beyond um it, it thinks about the societal um objectives that journey planners need to fulfill rather than just the the, suppose the monetary um or commercial objectives that that need to that need to be fulfilled um by journey planners and journey planning app developers and so i think you know john what you're saying is absolutely right in a lot of ways i'd agree with you but i also agree with nick in that it's not necessarily for government to solve but it is maybe for government to enable. Enable and guide, I would say, Nina. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I'd agree with you. Um, I I have to dash, but I'm going to rejoin the call. I'm just uh, getting onto a train, that's all. Um, so, um, but you, thank you, John. And I will, um, I have got your email and I will comment on it. Yeah. I mean, I, I'd also say, I, I see what Julie has put in the chat and, uh, Anthony had said as soon as it's cleared, he would be sending me a copy of the, the travel line report. So, you, you, you know, we've, we have that extra bit of information now, which yeah. I shall look at with interest. Right. Yeah. Thanks. Everyone. I think that's, that, that, that'll be very interesting to have a read of that over the next few weeks. I, I wonder whether, um, in the same way that, that Nick was sort of reframing what it, might be about actually with the wider societal view um actually maybe the best thing to look at um is actually um what information do people need and how do they want to consume it to help them make decisions about their journey um whether they use the private car whether they use public transport whether they walk or cycle um, with a much more multimodal um, view of the world to, to look at um, where, you know, government could be perhaps encouraging people to develop. So even if, you know, if they don't develop something themselves, what information do people need? Because I've not actually seen that anywhere, that everything that I've, I've seen so far has been an assumption that somebody wants to make a public transport journey or um you know they're going to walk it's that how do they make that decision um and what information do they need as individuals and as families to, to make some, that some, and maybe, yeah. with you know some years ago, the Jim, wider environmental stuff in um john yeah Yes, yeah, so some years ago, Tim, uh, I and Chris Bure and John Miles and Peter Warman did some work for Transport Direct on that very issue. I think it was 2004. It's probably uh, somewhere on the web in the uh, DFT archive, research archive, but it will be there somewhere. And there was actually a, a whole load of Transport Direct funded research as well somewhere in the DFT archive. 
Okay. Yeah. I think I've got a small comment on that. On it. Uh, so, going back to the example that John said earlier on about, you know, you had two different routes and the journey plan that gave you the wrong information. If on the whole purpose of BODS is to promote bus travel or promote public transport usage, and as a consumer, you're given a journey that looks wholly unrealistic, that's going to put you off using public transport again going forwards, and you'll just use your car again. I think some of the problems you've got some, with some journey plan is, is you've got no idea when the data was last updated or how relevant the information is for providing a journey. So I know that when sometimes in our track software, for example, it gives you hundreds of journey times. So I've compared that against Google, for example, and Google's given a different result. And you delve into that and you realize actually the Google uh, bus stopped uh, two weeks ago because it was, a, it was a change in service and actually Google's not updated the back end of things. And that's a slightly large, well, that's an area of concern we've always come across is actually people will use something and take that as face value. I'm not sure how you solve the issue, it's more just of a, of a, of a general comment. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with the point you're making, Tim, that, that it is really, we need to find out what the general public out there, whether they're users or non-users, really wants and how they would use it, which is why I think it is naturally within the uh, transport focus area. Um, in terms of multimodality, yes, clearly we, we already have got journey planners that will uh, give you cycle and uh, and walking options. Uh, Google Maps, indeed, I, I notice has started putting in uh, a, a car link at the beginning of a journey. I'm not sure whether it will include them in, in the middle of journeys, uh, but um, uh, you, you, you know that at least shows that Google are thinking about some of these problems as well. Mm -hmm. But the, the intention was not that it was going to be a big exercise to produce the ultimate journey planner, because the ultimate journey planner will probably never exist, things will keep changing. But what it was, was, was really to say, we should, if people are going to be finding on them, um, local authority websites, with Traveline, with the National Rail Journey Planner and what have you, if they're going to be finding different qualities of solution, that to me is something that DFT should be concerned about and should be providing uh, guidance, if not direction. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Has anybody got anything else to add to this? I mean, I think I'd just say that the more disruption information you've got in a journey planner, the more difference there will be between solutions because it will be dependent on time of day, cancellations, occupancy. So the more detailed we go in terms of what we give our customers, the bigger the difference becomes and the harder it is to measure because it's a real time journey plan um, and you can't really check it historically unless you've got an amazing journey plan that can recreate those Again, so I do understand that there needs to be a standard, but there needs to be some leeway within that where buses are cancelled because there are no drivers, there are floods, there are there are incidents that happen across the public transport network. But we, we know that we're going to start getting some occupancy data for both wheelchairs and for um, able body passengers. So that's where we will see the differences, and we do see the differences where people change the walk speeds in their journey planners. Um, because some of them are less able to walk faster than others. And that gives you a totally different search area. If you've got a search area from where you are now, one kilometre, and you walk faster than somebody else, you're going to get a quicker journey because you'll be able to get to the stop in a shorter amount of time. So um, it's phenomenally complicated. But I do, I do, um, I've seen some terrible journey plans and not just, um, yeah, that I've tried to do myself and haven't worked. So I, I completely understand where John's coming from. Yeah, thank you, Julie. Um, so we might have apologies from um, Keith Sabin from Shropshire, but uh, he did um, send me some uh, some feedback on on this um, about, and um, he was um, questioning whether the different journey planners that that had been used were using the same source data, um, and um, basically sort of covering the things that we've talked about about it. it's more nuanced um and um 
raising the um, London South East um, sort of experience, potentially being really quite different to more rural um, areas where there's much less service provision um, and the need to make sure that, uh, that it works um, anywhere uh, across the country. Um, okay, so um, John, um, where do we go from here on this, do you think? I think um, what I would suggest is that um, we put it on the agenda for the next meeting, ask people to think about it, have a look at the, uh, the travel line results and then, then revisit it. Yeah. Okay. And mean, meantime, I'll go back to Anthony Smith with it and, and I don't think there is anybody from Transport Focus on the call, is there? No. You, you, you know, maybe one of their people would like to uh, become involved as well. Hmm. It's, um, Guy Dangerfield sits on our board, so he's one of our directors. So um, I think he's pretty busy, but he might naturally be the yeah. most. Um, and he's also roads um, within DF, within Transport Focus. That's quite an interesting crossover. Hmm. Thanks, Julie. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Any more on uh, No. Okay. In which case, um, Julie, travel line project. Thanks, Kim. Well, um, you'll see that um, we published our research today, at least the qualitative stuff that we did with Transport Focus, which we started just before lockdown. Uh, there is a third phase, which includes um, quantitative, which is 2,000 um, questionnaires, and we couldn't um, do that because it wasn't right to ask people how happy they were on public transport whilst they were in lockdown. So we've chosen to suspend that piece of work, the funding's still in there, and the questionnaire that goes with that is open for consultation, so there's no reason in the world why we can't um, make a joint effort on this because we've already put the money aside to do this. The difficulty of course for us is working with 300 people with a view is um, more complicated than 12, but generally you only get 12 or 13 people who reply anyway who were genuinely interested so um, I wouldn't be against the idea of making that third phase something that we collaborate on um, and certainly transport focus we, we chose them because they published what, all the results there's nothing missing everything that we've seen is on the website um, so the whole industry including other open data users who are journey planning and local authorities can see that it's a resource for everybody that we funded um, and, and before I kind of launch into that, I think I'll just leave you to, to look at it. I mean, it's, it's only literally, I wasn't, I knew it was going to be, um, I was expecting it to go live yesterday, so Transport Focus were the ones that were going to be um, publishing it. So I haven't been able to let you know ahead of this meeting, unfortunately, because it must have just gone live just as you were starting. So and also I apologise for my voice, we've got, we've got three out of our team, five, we've all got COVID, so if I disappear, um, I'm okay, I've just lost my voice. <laughs> Um, so okay, so we've got the um, we've got the customer research. Um, some of the other things that um, we're doing within Travel Line will be to um, now that we've we've begun consuming some of the VODs data, the next um, phases will be um, adding um, a Where's My Bus to the Travel Line website. So we've talked about this earlier in this in this meeting about the difference between SM and VM. So we already have um, stop monitoring for. Um, 52 of the real-time feeds in the country, which doesn't cover all buses, and those are from local authorities, and we show those on maps. Um, we can see from ours there, because the customers don't find it and don't realise it's there, so we need to do something about that. But the other thing we're going to start doing, um, presentation aside, is add the bus to that, so you can see the bus going round. Now, at the moment, we can't match the bus journey, the bus trip, to the transport, the timetable data because the VM is not quite right, but that doesn't mean we can't use it. We can, it's the closest we can get to disruption information at the moment. It's allowing a customer to go, where's my bus, and see the number two surface going around and, and in relation to where they are. Um, of course, that means that if you've got a website, you've got to know where they are. So you've got to ask them to find where they are or put it into a journey plan and, and deliver it from there. So um, that's not the best way necessarily, and perhaps an app is what we need to go for. So the three um, priorities on top of the customer search that our board have um, 
asked me to spend, we had a Trumline tra Futures meeting last week, uh, and the first three projects we're going to start looking at to price up are the Where's My Bus, which um, will simply be taking a VMP from Boz and showing it on a map, it's not doing anything fancy. Um, the second one will be doing a simple fares demonstrator, so taking Netex data and showing fares on our journey plan, a single leg fare single and returns for the data that's on there at the moment. So we'll have to show this as a beta because it's we've seen the timescales for the Netex validator, the data isn't valid, there are obviously problems with it, it's a new data set, we can't, because it's a new data set, match it to the timetable perfectly. Um, so we'll be working with a supplier to figure out how we do that fuzzy match because it's going to have to be fuzzy to start with. Um, one of the big issues that Mir has talked about is that the service codes aren't working properly and of course those and that's the primary key for being two data sets is the service code, which, which actual bus is it and which route do we need. Um, and of course you need the timetable to know which um, trips are before nine o'clock and which are off peak. So you need all of that to make the whole geospatial stuff work properly. So we've got the Where's My Birth functionality going on. We're going to add, hopefully, a simple first demonstrator. And this is all subject to funding. Um, and then the, the final one is plus bus, what they call in phase one. So we want to add the ability to show a plus bus fare at a destination where the customer has planned a plus bus legal um, train journey that has the plus bus option at the end. So this is something that rail does at the moment, but it doesn't show you the bus options at the other end. So we use Silver Rail for our journey planner. They have two APIs. <coughs> excuse me. One of them is for rail, um, and they already know how to calculate a plus bus fare in that engine. The engine we use is their PTI engine, which doesn't have that capability in it. So they're going to, um, subject to funding again, um, they know that they can technically do it, reply in their Silver Rail response to us that there is plus bus available, and then we can look at how we design that on our site. And that's beginning to look at how we integrate travel and um, encourage people to stay on the public transport network. Um, we've also looked at adding a carbon calculator, bringing in private um, modes, and all these things we can test in that questionnaire. Because, you know, as Mira's quite right, he said, we're not for profit, we're not doing this to make money. We want people to be able to find the right answers. Um, and interestingly, in our research, we've got a number of um, options people can pick that allows them to speed up their walk and slow it down. Nobody seems to want to use that, it's too difficult but they do want to know how to widen their search area, which is the same function. So we've just got to figure out how to put it in a less techie way, um, look further afield or however you do it. Um, so there's quite a lot of interesting stuff going on. Um, we will be starting in the new year running workshops, which will be open to everybody, but they are kind of geared around VSIPs. So there's a lot of the stuff that we do, which we could change to make your local authority VSIPs work better that you could deliver. Now, this is not, about us needing funding to do that. It's about us having a resource that we pay for that your data's in that we think we could leverage and do a lot more with for you. So we already allow local authorities to use the Silver Rail Journey Planning API. So this kind of goes back to, there is a, there is a cost to that, but it's really low cost. Um, Travel by Northeast uses it. Um, there are other local authorities who use it, and Good Journey uses it. So the, the actual API response is something that we can share through our contract. And you know, you can ask it different questions. So Travel Line chooses to ask, ask questions in a certain way and ask the fastest, but it's a really complex journey planner. So you might not choose just to ask the fastest. So even if you're using the same journey planning API, you can ask it different questions and get different answers. So that's the first observation is. If it does it on travel line, it doesn't necessarily mean that's the silver rail answer. That's the answer to the question that we've asked. So we probably haven't really thought about that layer of detail here. The other thing you can do if you use an API, whichever one it is, whether it's silver rail or Google, is you can build your own journey planning on top of that. So you can go off to a cycle planning engine, you can go off to your um, e-bikes and your cargo bikes and you know, your e-scooters. You can build their API once there is one into that. So you don't need everything in one planner. You need to have building blocks that work together that deliver in your layer, which could be an app, uh, it could be a could be a web service. So that's just that's one way that you could um, sort of leverage what we do. But also, there are lots of asks within the BSIPs that you've all put in um, that could be something we could do for you really easily that we just didn't think of, that or that we could prioritise because it would mean you would get your funding or that you would be able to tick that box. Bearing in mind, is it February now that you'll get your settlements? I'm not sure, it's, it's not now, it's, it's later. So we don't really know how that's going to work, but Transport Travel Line started off as a local authority organisation. It's jointly managed nationally now, 
um, by operators, local authorities, transport focus, CPT, and it's still a resource that should be there for local authorities. So now that we've kind of come out the other side of COVID and we've stopped spending 60 hours a week worrying about bods and trying to fix that, um, not fix it, sorry, work with it, um, we can concentrate on moving forward and, and sharing some of what we do and making sure that it's trying to help everybody, not just our customers, but your customers are our customers. So if we can do something nationally in a not-for-profit way that we can fund, then why would we not do that? So, you know, big workshops with local authorities, should they want to take part? It doesn't mean operators can't be in it or this group can't be in it. I think the more the merrier, really. So working on what we could do, either to change our API, to make it more available, um, how we can help you put stuff in um, web layers. We've got a sort of an intermediate solution, which is a widget. So <clears throat> on our journey planner, we've got a little box in the middle of the screen, and that's our widget. So as a local authority, you can have that widget running on your page from our servers. So you can't configure it differently. It looks exactly the same as ours, but you can put your branding on it. So it doesn't have to be Traveline branded. We deliberately left that box in the middle vanilla so that you could use it as your own. Um, and there's a bit of script there that you can change to make the corners rounded or square, depending on how your site's been designed. You can change the colours, you can put your own logo on it. But that's something that, um, again, if you look at the Traveline Northeast website, it's their site, but the widget is running from our servers and we can see all the Google Analytics on that, um, and that's very low cost. So if you don't want to configure Silver Eye yourself and you don't want to design the search and the other stuff that happens on top of an API, then you've got that middle option of being able to embed that onto your own website. Um, of course, if you get that, it's much you get less choice. It's cheaper for you to do because you don't have to deal with all the UI stuff and the design, but of course you get less individual choice because it is how it is. Um, and we'll only change travel line if our customers think it's right and if we're funded. So um, we've already got those things and we just want to do more with local authority in, in the next year to make sure that we continue to give you as much value for money as you can and um, whilst meeting your customer needs. Um, the plus plus phase two is going to phase two would be to actually move to looking at if we could sell plus plus tickets. But of course, before we do that, we have to get our barcode ticketing project live. So that's the other big thing that we're doing at the moment in Traveline. Of course, we've been managing plus plus since the first of April. We now have, um, unbelievably, the technical side has delivered six weeks early. So we're now able to sell plus plus um, barcode tickets for. Um, day out type tickets and in some areas seven days as well. Um, we haven't gone live yet. We've made a decision with RDG and with um, with, the, with the operators. The train operators have to make them live at each station and RDG can do that for them. So the on switch will happen when we're all ready. So when all of the bus operators and participating local authorities in the area know it's happening and have trained their drivers. Um, we're designing a, a kind of bus driver's post that tells you what the barcode ticket is about. Um, and that will be ready to start going live towards the end of January, beginning of February. We'll be doing all sorts of comms with that. In a sense, we're quite limited because there are only three of us um, essentially doing all this sort of project management. And at the moment, two of us have COVID once on leave, so we're down to zero. So in terms of social media and marketing, that's something that we'd have to ramp up later in the year if we need to do that. Um, but for example, recently we've had GWR contact us asking if they can use the Travel Line Journey Planner on their um, on their posters next to the Plus Plus one. They didn't know we were the same organisation because they want their customers to get bus journeys for the whole country. Um, and that's what they want to add. So I just think possibly marketing what we do, it doesn't have to be brand new travel line. It's what we do in the back office that you can use, that other people can use to try to encourage people to choose their way of using public transport. Um, and that, as Mira has quite rightly said, doesn't necessarily mean the quickest way it's the way that suits you the best. So I think that's, um, yeah, that's my list of things. Okay, thank you, Julie. Um, any questions for Julie? No, okay, <coughs> excellent. I hope you uh, uh, recover quickly, Julie. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to uh, I'm going to leave you to it now. But if, you, if anyone's got any questions, you've got my email address. Happy Christmas, everybody. And to you. Okay, so moving on, um, probably the longest agenda item um, you'll come across: contact management system to electronic display standard interface. 
Um, bit of a mouthful. Um, this is some work that Arctic are doing with Transport for Wales um, to try and um, get to the point where authorities, when they've got a um, content management system and um, displays out on street and in shopping centres or wherever they happen to be, um, if they go out and buy um, another display manufacturer's um, displays, they don't end up needing to have to um, put messages um, and content into multiple content management systems all the time to reduce the, uh, the, the, the overhead of providing good quality customer information. So we're looking at how we um, introduce a standard where you can plug supplier A's display into supplier's B content management system um, using standard interfaces. Um, that's been running for um, a good few months now. Um, we talked about it back in September at the last PTIC. Um, we are now at the point where um, we have um, late drafts of the first of the first two parts of the documentation. So we have um, designed the um, communications and network architecture that it needs to support um, using something that's new to the UK public transport market called MQTT. Um, it's not new um, standard, it's new to public transport in the UK, um, but it's got quite wide adoption in um, Scandinavia, Denmark, Germany, um, within public transport. Um, it's just new over here. So we've got the architecture um, bottomed out and um, we have got um, the stand, the, the, the basic data structures um, and messages that are needed to support um, what we're calling um, basic text displays. So if you think about your traditional three line LED, um, that can you know display numbers and um, letters, um, those sort of type basic displays. We've got the um, the, the core structures and messages for that, um, and um, we will be publishing version one of that. Um, hopefully, pending um, any um, problematic comments um, in early January. Um, and then we're going to start working on um, what is needed to support graphical displays. So if you think about TFTs, um, how you might get um, you know, advertising content um, and news feeds um, out of to those. Um, and then we'll look at if there's anything needed for um, more specialist displays battery displays, low power displays, those sort of off grid type things. Um, and then look at what we need to add on in future as things develop. You know, so how do we support accessibility requirements um, and capabilities? So um, you know, audio or increasing font sizes like we're seeing on some um, displays now when um, when it knows that there's somebody um, nearby that needs uh, increased fonts and that sort of thing. So um, in, in January we'll be publishing the, the basics that will support text-based displays and then over the coming months um, we'll um, slowly increase the functionality um, to, to the point where um, pretty much all the displays and functionality that, that people have been um, asking for is properly supported. Um, and um, looking at the procurements and things like that that have been um, 
already referencing this um, probably by the autumn 2022. The first uh, live implementations will start to be out there. Maybe later version one might not work properly and things like that. But uh, you know, during 2022, certainly we'll uh, we'll start to see the first implementations using this, um, which will be a uh, big step forward. Uh, if you want to get involved. Um, the events and all the content and things like that are available on the um, Artig website. Um, has anybody got any questions, comments, thoughts about CMS the display interface? Yeah, I, I, I was going to ask uh, Tim um, if we're, we're buying a lot of battery signs in Leicester, um, so which will have a particular CMS. So presumably, because these predate this kind of uh, standardisation, when and if we change our our um, supply supplier of if if we happen to change our RTI supplier, then we're, we're going to be struggling with this problem, aren't we? Um, so part of the um, challenge that we've been looking at is is not just how do you, um, you know, get to the point where if you buy a new CMS and a new display, they work, is, is how might this affect the thousands of displays that are out there? Um, and so in the architecture, there are options that would effectively enable an existing CMS to pretend to be um, a display and subscribe to um, this using this standard. So you might be able to, um, with a, a bit of work under you know, um, your battery powered display CMSs, that'll need a few tweaks. Um, and a bit of development, but um, you could then plug it into, you know, a different CMS if you change real-time suppliers or something like that. So we do. It does look to how how can we support you know, the existing displays and content management systems that are out there. Oh, that sounds good. Yeah. So it's not just it's not just drawing a line in the sand and everything going forward. It potentially can help uh retrospectively as well that, that's yeah. that's that, that's excellent yeah well, thank you yeah yes okay no other questions on that um artig publications um so over the last few months um uh, a number of working groups that Artig's had running um, during this year have come to completion. So we have, um, over the last few months since we last met, published um, a paper um, which uh, looks at bridge strikes. Um, so buses um, hitting uh, low bridges, um, a pretty serious problem. Um, do have to say um, up front, it's not as big a problem for buses hitting low bridges as it is for um, high-sided vehicles um, hitting low bridges, but uh, it's still a problem and you do still um, see it in the news uh, far too regularly. Um, so there's a paper on that providing some advice on um, practical things that people can do to um, avoid it. Um, as well as um, electronic solutions um, that might help. Um, we have also um, published um, a report on audiovisual um, next stop um, on bus displays um, and audio equipment um, in preparation for the accessible information regulations, which are coming. Uh, next year so um some of you well yeah 
it's actually the only T TFL, I think, is the only off operator um, on the call who've obviously got these. Um, but hopefully it helps operators and um, authorities if you're looking at working with um, small operators to, to see through the, um, the maze of different solutions and options. Um, and both of those are publicly available to anybody. Um, for those of you that are members, um, uh, also available if you join. This might be enough to encourage you to join. Um, there is a um, paper on um, passenger counting solutions, um, something that's um, occupied a lot of people's minds over the last um, uh, 18 months or more. Um, uh, a lot of temporary solutions have been put in place. This looks at um, everything from you know, somebody pressing a button on a ticket machine through to uh, the most advanced camera-based solutions with AI and all sorts of things involved um, and the different options. So um, that is available and out there. Um, and um, it's a bit late in the day to be promoting this here um, but there is a um, guide to producing Christmas and New Year data for submission into BODS um, looking at how you should uh, code um, all of the different days and things like that that we've published in October um, and uh, something that uh, I think we'll carry on doing um, on a regular basis in advance of um, uh christmas holidays um and i also think that it's probably a special one to do um providing advice on the um on the queen's jubilee next year which is going to be particularly challenging um because um it's a bank holiday on the thursday that's been moved from the monday um as well as the uh, additional day which is a friday so uh, that's going to uh, confuse some uh, some people and some systems, I'm sure. Um, so they're the recent publications from Artig. Um, anybody so, have any questions? I was going to say, um, with your thing about the Christmas data, Tim, that's um, it. That that's about the um, the technicalities of all the different day types and bank holiday types and such like. Yeah, it, do, it doesn't get around the fact that we get some operators, um, obviously that remain nameless, but we the data comes in extremely late, <laughs> and you've just got to make the best of what you can with it. So yeah, we 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 can produce advice to help yeah. people, but uh, we can't make that particular horse drink the water. Um, no. and, and the advice was that uh, Christmas data really needed to be done by uh, I think it was the 18th of November if it was going to be in journey planners in sufficient time for people to be planning their their Christmas journeys, um, which um, was uh, an eye opener for quite a lot of. Uh, people i think even the best struggle to meet that i think it's fair to say that's all i will say on that <laughs> cheers yeah okay um moving on to um eu standards um development um We've been talking about up and update to, to Siri to Siri 2.1 for quite a long time. We're really close now for um, the core parts of it, parts one to four. Um, Siri SX um, will uh, will probably be another uh, six months or so before it is published because of the uh, the 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 slow processes um, within Sen. Um, but one to four is um, um, about to be published um, by BSI. Um, drafts are available on the Artig website if you know the hidden link. Um, if you don't, then let me know. Um, then um, NetEx, since we last met, 
part five of NetX on alternative modes. So that is things like scooters and carpools and shared bikes, fixed and um, those that get left around wherever somebody happens to dump it. Um, that is supported now through um, part five. Um, the um, on-vehicle communications, road scheduling and control systems, um, there's a number of updates um, coming to those standards, um, including um, uh, future sections of that, looking at standardising automatic passenger counting, um, so you can plug and play from different um, suppliers, um, which um, will uh, include um, the use of things like MQTT, so as per the content management system to display interface that we just talked about, um, and um, a plug for um, the group data for PT, um, which is trying to um, encourage the use of um, standards such as NetX and Siri, um, Transmodel family of things, um, and they've got an increasing library of uh, advice and support for people wanting to, uh, to to get involved in implementing uh, those and understand more about that. Um, any questions on European standards? No, the normal plug, if you want to get involved in standards development, please let me know. We are always wanting more volunteers, mugs, whatever you want to um, uh, call. It, it can be really interesting. It can also be really boring as well. Um, OK, um, that then takes us on to issues log. Um, there's, there's very few issues uh, on the log at the moment. Um, there are two, though, the, um, of the three open ones that um, can be closed. So issues 98 and 99, which is to do with vehicle fuel types um, in um, series. Um, they are now included in... Um, Series 2.1, um, and so um, if we uh, close that because uh, that work's being done and signed off um, and is about to become available to people. Um, please do feel free to use the um, issues log process. So if you've got a problem that you think you found with a standard, um or if you think it needs to support something or you think there should be a change um in some way then um the issues log is the way to um go about that um and we'll make sure that it gets passed to the right people and uh make sure that change is properly discussed um and either accepted or explained why or, or whatever Okay, um, so that then takes us on to um, any other business? Anybody got anything that they want to raise? No? Okay. Um, in which case, um, date of the next meeting, um, going by the normal um, cycle of things, that should be in um, March. Um, so uh, we will have a look at the uh, diary of events and things like that and uh, try and avoid um, any clashes. Um, and... Um, set that up okay um and that just leaves me to say um thank you for your time and attendance today 
Um, it's been good session, some good discussion, um, and have a very happy Christmas and New Year, um, and try and avoid getting the dreaded virus. <laughs>